In the U.S., there's something called a double header. Anyone know uh, American baseball? Sometimes if they have a, a game that's canceled because of rain, but they're already in town, they'll actually play two games after each other. It's a very long day for the, for the players, and they, it's called a double header. So it's kind of what this is here. Uh, you get to have a, a double header. <laughs> So uh, uh, I don't need to introduce myself again, uh, but this session, uh, we're now going to go uh, and look more at the uh, uh, sink and share, so more at the collaboration, whereas the last presentation was looking at, let's say, accessing shared data within, uh, 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 within your, your environment, uh, within your OpenStack cloud. This one is now looking more at how can we enable sharing of data and collaboration across, uh, across clouds, across institutions. Um, so first, I, I thought I would just talk, talk a, a, a little bit about object storage. Um, so I think everyone knows what object storage is. Uh, and if, if I were to look at object storage and, and kind of look at four different areas, there are many different areas you can, uh, you can critique when looking at an object storage solution. But if I pick, pick four, if I just start at the left, um, one of the areas that I often see people looking at is, is efficiency. Uh, trying to reduce the cost. You have a lot of petabytes of data, you know, even a 10% savings is a substantial um, financial savings. Uh, so erasure coding. And if you look at the market, all of the, let's say all of the solutions today, generally speaking, have erasure coding uh, feature function built in. The next area that I would look at, if I were you, is the API support of this uh, object storage. Uh, and I would say these days, uh, S3 and Swift are really the leaders. Probably S3 is even, even further out uh, a front, right? The, the protocol that Amazon introduced and has kind of become the de facto standard uh, for object storage. Um, but I would also suggest that you look at the completeness of the API, because these APIs also include many, many different attributes or attributes, function calls, uh, feature support, and not all object storage support all of those commands uh, that you might want to use or support all of those commands in a performant way. So it's something that you should look at if you're looking at, uh, at the API interfaces offered by all of the different object storages on the market. Uh, the next one I would uh, suggest that you look at is uh, the support for multiple sites. Um, so the, the, having a native understanding of what sites are and being able to distribute and manage data uh, objects across those sites. And I would say here, uh, it's supported by most, but not all of the object storages understand the concept of sites. And especially if you're doing collaboration, I can imagine that might be an important uh, criteria. And then the last one uh, that I would uh, tell you, uh, uh, I, would, uh, I would look at, is, is looking at, at, at how expansion works. Because object storage is, is typically distributing data across many nodes. And how this is done and, and, and how this is handled in case of adding nodes or removing nodes or moving nodes can also be quite critical. If you have uh, petabytes of data and it's a, a, lot of, a big copy action, if you have to add nodes, that is, is, is going to be a problem uh, when it comes to operations. Um, so if I would say, if we're looking at research environments, these last two are ones that I would put a little bit more special attention on uh, to see how uh, the storage you're looking at uh, works, both if you're looking at commercial options or open source options, of course. Now, NetApp has a solution in this area. So earlier, uh, you know, I mentioned that NetApp is a data management company. We're not just those, those filers, right? Here's an example. So this is a software that we have uh, that is an object storage server. It's a, 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 a grid architecture, has many nodes uh, supporting uh, this application. Uh, it is software defined. Uh, so earlier I also mentioned that uh, the, the products that we bring today have appliance versions and software only versions. This is no exception. So you can either have uh, building blocks where you buy essentially a disk shelf that is a storage node uh, ready, you know, it's, it's running the storage uh, software directly in the appliance, or you can run it on a VM. And if you run it on a VM, you use whatever storage you have in the back end. 
that's your uh, choice. Um, so, uh, and, and something maybe that's a little bit interesting is actually these are running in Docker containers today. So I can imagine the, the kind of designs that might be possible in the future as containerized workloads uh, continue increasing in, in, in the environment. Uh, this uh, is well suited and well, uh, will be a good fit for it. Uh, storage Grid supports this concept of multi-sites and I'll, I'll give an example of how this works. It also has uh, policy-based management. So what that means is that uh, uh, depending on, on metadata of an object, uh, we, can, we can manage the life cycle of that object. So maybe today you're using a lot of, again, NFS uh, uh, would be an example as a shared repository, and then maybe you're mirroring data. So maybe you have a volume at, at your university in the s south of Germany, and you're mirroring it to your, your partner university in the north of Germany. Well, you're, you're, you're mirroring the entire volume, all of the files in the volume. It's read-only at the destination. Making access, access of it is not, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a, different, a different copy. It's, it's some effort to make use of it. Uh, with, with object storage, uh, you don't have this kind of uh, challenge because you have a global namespace and the policies are able to replicate these data uh, at the object level. Storage Grid supports access via S3 and via uh, Swift. Also has NFS and SIFS access, but I would say S3 is probably the most common uh, protocol used uh, today. And in the end, what it's giving you is really a durable, very high levels of durability, low cost uh, archive, active archive layer for a variety of kind of use cases across the top there. So how does this concept of a global namespace and global scalability actually work? So if we look, uh, um, the first thing I, I'd like to draw your attention to is you'll see that I have four sites here. So I could have, I could have just one site if I want, but typically you have more than one site. So in this case, four sites. If a user ingests data in San Francisco, you can ingest data anywhere in the grid. Any of these locations can have data coming in. As soon as the data has been acknowledged, it's now available in the namespace and can be accessed from any of the nodes. So you'll see here over here, this user in Tokyo went to read the data and he was able to do so. Now, if the data uh, uh, was using a policy that had already put a copy in Tokyo, then he would have received local access times because the data would have been locally in Tokyo. He would have accessed it in Tokyo, he was done. If it wasn't there, it would be fetched by the node in Tokyo from the node in San Francisco or from another node if it was re uh, already existing in another site. Where that data is, is, is going to reside is defined in policies. Policies that tell you which site you want it to reside in or how many copies you want it to reside in. It can be very powerful of thinking about collaboration because you have this object level granularity of data management. Storage Grid supports up to 16 sites, you know, 70 petabytes of data and 100 billion objects. So they're, they're pretty good sizes. I would say for user generated content, these are certainly large enough. Even for a, a lot of machine generated content use cases, these are uh, these are sufficient. If we then look at uh, now specifically at a file sync and share use case, um, I want to, to, to give, a, give a, a picture here. So we, we know that a lot of collaboration occurs between uh, different research institutions. And uh, a popular solution for this is using own cloud. Yeah? So using own cloud local deployment in each site. So here at University A and University B, they both have their own own cloud deployments. And then federation is being used at the, at the own cloud layer in order to, to do sharing of data, right? To give uh, the users the, the perception and the visibility of data, both at their institution and at other institutions. And this works quite well. But what happens about data availability, durability, and efficiency of this solution? Basically, each institution needs to come and to, to think about how they're going to protect their data, right? How are they going to protect it at University A? Do they have multiple sites? What happens if one of the locations goes down? The data isn't going to be available. 
What happens if it were to, to be unavailable permanently, you know, uh, uh, some disaster at that location? What would happen? Well, in order to solve those, you're probably going to have some kind of storage replication or storage placement at another site. This is where, where Storage Grid can really help. Storage Grid can provide this federated layer at the data layer, so below own cloud. And if we look, uh, here's an example where now University uh, uh, C has been added. And when it was added, we can add that into the grid. We, we, we can add this dynamically. Um, we don't have to, to, to plan ahead to know which universities or how many we will have. And also now the, the, the data is going to be managed by Storage Grid itself. So Storage Grid, the, the objects in Storage Grid are accessible now via any of these three sites. Yeah, because the namespace is global. Where the data actually sits is defined by policies. So how do these policies work? So policies can de be defined uh, on object metadata. And some of the object metadata types are the uh, are standard ones, right, that are always there. You know, we know the timestamp that the data was ingested. We know the last time the data was accessed. We know the name of the object or the key. But it can also be set to fire on any custom metadata. So metadata that you uh, put uh, uh, as part of the object when you stored it. Once we have this, um, this metadata, we can then do things with it. So we can decide maybe how many copies we want of this metadata, or of this object, uh, where we want these objects to be. We can handle the lifecycle management. Maybe in the short term, we want more copies uh, at more locations, and in the, in the long term, fewer copies in fewer locations, all the way uh, uh, down to erasure encoding or uh, outing uh, uh, tape out uh, of, this, uh, of this data. And you can also change it any time you want. So if you change it and you apply that policy, the grid is then going to start to, to basically make the, the data in the grid compliant again by adding or removing uh, data as it needs to. So here's an example of the GUI that you can use to, to configure this. So if I had configured uh, the ingest time as my, uh, uh, my, the metadata that I wanted to operate with, and then I said here, I, I want three copies. I want a copy of this data to be at University A, B, and C. That means when the data is ingested, it's going to be uh, copied and placed to all these three locations. You can then see down here at the bottom, there's a, a, a slightly different rule. So the first one was valid for the first 120 days. After 120 days, uh, we've decided that we'd actually want to optimize for efficiency. So we're going to actually erasure and code these objects instead of uh, uh, duplicating them. You can see it's quite easy to configure. There isn't a lot of uh, uh, complexity here. You could also use this with any other of the metadata attributes. So today with OwnCloud, there, there isn't any, um, the ability to set uh, additional uh, metadata attributes. But this could be something I can imagine using a, a, a plugin of some sort that you could set additional metadata attributes that could then be keyed on here. So if you had data that you didn't want to leave your country or your institution, right, there are, there are a lot of possibilities here uh, using these policies. And if you kind of then look at, at how this looks from an, a, an example perspective after you've applied this policy, you can see that in this case, okay, all data uh, uh, that has been uh, ingested into the uh, object store will be stored three times, one time at University A, B, and C, and then after 128, 120 days, it's going to be erasure encoded uh, amongst universities A, B, and C. So if you're thinking from a file and share perspective, this, I think, could, could help reduce the cost you need of the backing storage behind your own cloud or other file sync and share application. Because you, you can make use of your, all, all of the other institutions um, as your additional sites to increase the durability increase the availability of the, the data. And I'd say kind of uh, uh, finally, it's, it's very important to, you know, to, to, to keep the data secure. I mean, I, I think uh, the most important thing that any storage solution does, any 
right, is, is keep the data. It, it's really, really simple, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get right, right? If you, if you have a problem and your system panics, right, okay, you reboot, you're back up, right, on, on a normal Linux host. If, you're, if your disk panics, right, your file system panics, it's quite a, a bit more disruptive. You've lost actually the value and it's quite hard to get back. So Storage Grid has a, a variety of features uh, that enable us to ensure that the data that's stored is also the data that's retrieved. We do this on a regular basis, uh, checking the system. The ch system is checking the objects themselves to make sure that they are uh, still available and that they're still compliant. Uh, with a variety of uh, different kinds of checksums and tests. Also, the data is secure from an encryption perspective. It's encrypted on disks. It's also encrypted using uh, TLS over the wire. Availability can be quite high, and maybe, maybe this one here is really the, something else to draw your attention to. You know, the, the, the durability that you can achieve is just you know, outrageous, right? It's, it's really you, you, you don't lose data. Uh, with, with this system because of all of the, the feature function it provides. Which for archive and research data, of course, uh, uh, might not be able to be recreated. It's quite important that it stays there. So to just summarize, there, there are three things that I'd like to, you to leave with from this presentation. So the first is this thing called Storage Grid Web Scale. This is a distributed object storage from NetApp. The second thing is what's unique about this software is it has this policy-driven interface that allows you to work at the object level and decide where the data will be stored in the enterprise and manage it over the life cycle so that you don't have to, uh, to do that yourself. And this is an application, especially due to the durability and the, and the management aspects, it's, it's best suited for large data sets that are going to be maintained and kept for a long period of time. You know, your active archive use cases. Yeah, that's what I had. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I think we have time for a couple of questions. Anyone? While people are maybe preparing, I have a question on the durability. Sure. Um, how did you compute it? Because this is, uh, you, if you go to the previous, if you go to the previous slide, the first one is, is pretty clear. Uh, yeah. The availability is the probability of being there. Well, the durability is essentially is one minus the probability to have, an, uh, to have, a, to have a disaster. Yeah. Well. <laughs> this is a good question for the presenter that's not here. Okay. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a combination of, of uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a combination of the, uh, the erasure encoding and, and basically the, the number of copies and the erasure encoding that can be configured. This is the... Uh, so the durability that's calculated from that, but the, the details on how to calculate so it is the mathematical don't. probability correct. not to lose, not to have a, to have a disaster, disaster in, in the that system. That causes data loss, okay. correct. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, please, David. Um, are you eventually consistent or spread your seed this way? Because the moment you start traveling you know, globally like that, um, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, at a passing glance, it looked very much like Swift. Mm -hmm. Many, sh and it almost wouldn't surprise me if there were some shared ideas given the massive contributions you guys have made um, to OpenStack, but um, eventually or strictly consistent? So, so when, when data is ingested, uh, it's first saved into two different storage nodes on a single site. So it's done that to ensure that if we had any uh, uh, yeah, temporary or uh, not temporary, immediate kind of failure, we wouldn't lose the data. After that, and at that moment, as soon as it's acknowledged and been written to two locations, at that moment, the object is available and it is globally available within the namespace, that single version of the object. Uh, then the policies kick in. So the policies say, okay, I have my two copies. What's actually my end state? My end state is I want to be in three different locations, okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make copies and, and be available in three locations. If at any time uh, in the middle there, access is tried, the system knows where the, 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 the first copies were, so to speak, uh, and those will be retrieved and provided. 